there was a time when people were making records in their bedrooms, and I think that's awesome. I think if you don't have, you know, uh, if you don't have the wherewithal to go and make a record and it's what you want to do and uh, the gods at the record companies have deemed that you're not cool enough or whatever or commercial enough, I think it's fantastic that you have that ability to have inexpensive equipment in your bedroom and, and make incredible sounding records because I have mixed some of those records that um, they literally have been recorded in bedrooms like, you know, with beds and pillows and sheets and stuff. <laughs> and um, not not like the Dave Grohl garage band with this massive studio at the back and swimming pool and islands and things. I really love that um, that creative expression has an outlet that it could be done like that. Um, it's interesting, you know, when you go back to Muscle Shoals and you see uh, that Rick Hall had all of these guys playing instruments and he was balancing everything and they was all coming through one little console with, with these ro big huge rotary knobs and and it's you know, it sounded amazing. I mean, uh, there is nothing like it. There's nothing like, I think musicians have to play together. Like, it, it, apart from it being like your job description when you get into it. Like, you know, I remember, remember going to cut uh, uh, Brave New World with Iron Maiden in 1999 now. So it's 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And I said, we're all going to cut these things. We're all going to go into the room together. And I remember there being apprehension about this you know it's like oh really we haven't done this like you know we haven't really done this when making records and since then they won't do it any other way because there is an interaction there and there is uh, an emotional tie to what you're doing when you do it like that and there's a push natural push and pull you know not everyone's gonna dig it because some people you know some people just don't like pie and you know, that's the way I, that's, that's my choices. The Rush Counterparts album. No, we didn't do it that way. But that was a different animal. That was, that was a different animal. We, uh, we had the guide tracks for the Rush Counterpart album already done. So there was, part of their demos was cut to click tracks without Neil involved. So Getty and Alex had done uh, guide track vocals and some guitars, and they had the structure fleshed out in a basic form in the in the guide track. And then we laid that down, and then they started playing on top of that. So um, Neil did play his drums to those tracks, and then we built them up from there. But where um, where I stuck my uh, dirty nose in was I really uh, was insistent on it being as analog sounding as possible because. I didn't actually mince my words when speaking to them. I didn't like the sound of Presto and Roll the Bones, which were the two albums before. Right. I didn't like that synthy approach and that new wave approach that they had, you know, uh, integrated into into what they were playing. And I, you know, I, I've always been drawn to the more Deep Purple Led Zeppelin school of of rock, anyway. So. Um, uh, you know, I remember having stand-up knockdown fights with uh, Alex about the guitars he used, and he, you know, he used to, he had some PRSs. Paul, no disrespect, but he had some PRSs, and I was, you know, I said, how can you play those coffee tables? It's like play a real guitar, get a Les Paul, and I love Paul, by the way, uh, but uh, that's was really what I said back then, and uh, um, and the same with Getty, he came in with these huge galleon kruger speakers with these green cones and all that and it just sounded like you know like a piano strings the bass ding dong ding dong and i went out the back room and i found a little b15 amplifier out there and it had a blown speaker and i, I said getty plug this in i didn't know the speaker was blown and it went <laughs> and i was like definitely we're definitely going to use that and he was like i don't know about that and i was like just trust me that's going to cut right through the track and he played the whole album on that little B-15 with the blown speaker and with, you know, all the dis distortion coming from a, it wasn't a blown speaker, it had a cut in the speaker. So it had all this distortion coming from the cut in the speaker. And so it was a different animal. We did track it differently, but there was a lot of heart and analog in that record. Oh, I loved working with Led Zeppelin. I mean, just f from the point of view of working with them, 
as my favorite band from growing up, you know, and like so many. Uh, but I said to Jimmy Page at one point during, I said, you know, this is the soundtrack of my life. He said, Kevin, it's the soundtrack of my life. And I was like, all right, well, you got a point there. <laughs> yeah. But it was just fantastic, you know, to, to, to go into, uh, you know, a room as I did when I started working with them. And I went in with Bill Kerbishley, the manager, and there was just tape boxes everywhere. And he said, look, it's a, you know, trove of treasures uh, ahead of us. And it actually was, you know, just a, an inventory of nightmare because all these old moldy tapes needed to be baked and transferred before we could finally, like, listen to what was on them. But that was just a, you know, it was really a, it was a joy of a session. It took much longer than we thought it would take. And, uh, you know, to all intents and purposes, I was left to learn to do, you know, a lot of that stuff. Uh, Jimmy and I certainly went through everything and selected what we, what was going to make the cut. And um, But, you know, th at that point, uh, you know, I was left to my own devices. And, and, uh, and you know, I really feel like that was, that was, um, uh, just a whole labor of love in that in that project and and I you know I there was, wasn't a day or a situation that came up that I that I uh, you know I didn't love there were challenges you know um, but the cool thing was that I could hear what I wanted it to sound like before I started it because I'd heard the records and so all of a sudden you know you know what John Bonham's meant to sound like get to it and then you turn on the tapes and they'd be just well they're just drums so we have to you know manipulate them to get them to sound like that and that was you know it was it was very cool and and it was um gratifying and it was really funnily enough not um not uh it, it, i i was never anxious about it because i really as you know as as much as i can compartmentalize recording and producing and mixing it was much the same once i got to do the job it was just another job of really trying to do, you know, trying to make it sound as good as I could, and, and I really enjoyed that, you know, and uh, one day I did a song of, I did a mix of uh, Since I've Been Loving You, and and Jimmy came in, and he listened to it, and he said, oh, sounds great, sounds great, and he went away, and I went home, and I had this, he went home, I was living in London, and I listened to it in the car, and I thought, oh, I, I think I can do it a little better than that. I came back in the next day, and I started a remix of it. And Jimmy came and said, what are you doing? I said, I think I can do a like, better version of this you know, since I've been loving you. And I didn't do that very often. He said, no, it sounds good. So I said, all right, then, fine. It's like, I'm not going to argue. You know, it's really no point in arguing about that. If, you, if you're happy with it, then I'm more than happy with it. But uh, it was a real, that was a real, you know, real pleasure. and A real pleasure, and, and I'm thrilled with the way it came out. You know, we had, we had... Uh, we have had bumped our heads since then, Mr. Page and I, but I suppose that's not uncommon for people that have connections with him, and it's just the way it goes, you know. That's what artistic people do. So I was sitting there mixing, um, mixing Dazed and Confused for the Led Zeppelin DVD, and I was so, it's, we were in the violin bow sequence, and I was so, I was concentrating, Trading so hard, trying to program like this violin bow to go around the room like this and go around the room and swirl. And then I was sitting there working, and then there was a hand on my shoulder. And then I, I was really busy, and I looked up, and it was Sir Paul McCartney in his uh, three-piece suit and sandals. And I said, he said, hello, is Jimmy here? And I said, no, um, I'm kind of busy right now. And he said, all right, then. So I went back to it, and I finished up the mix, and then I went, fuck. That was Paul McCartney. <laughs> so that was one of those one of those stories that probably doesn't sound like much, but it was at the moment it was um, a boot in the bum.